my heroes were people like Peter Drucker and Warren Bennis and Francis Kesselbein and Al Malali, who totally changed my life. And then I went through this program with Aisha, and she said, you should be more like them. That's what led me to the idea of asking, you know, I thought 100 people, would, I would adopt 15 people and 100 people would apply to be adopted. Well, it turned out 18,000 people applied to be adopted. And now we've had 350 people in our group and it's totally changed my life. So what's been some of your reflections, the impact you've had on me, which has created a huge change for hundreds of people? Yeah. And by the way, you have changed my life. So I think it's totally reciprocal. It, <laughs> and that, that's the beauty of it, I think, that, um, it, that that's true collaboration, you know. Hmm. Absolutely amazing. Well, okay, coming up, is it possible to future-proof your future? You could say failing by design instead. Our next guest knows everything about that topic because she coined that very term. Rita McGrath is a best-selling author, a sought-after speaker and a long-term um, professor at Columbia Business School. She is widely recognized as a premier expert on leading innovation and growth during times of uncertainty. And believe me, there's a lot of uncertainty right now out there. Rita has received the number one achievement award for strategy from the prestigious Thinkers 50. And then I don't have to tell you, she also have an amazing book. In fact, she has several amazing books. Uh, seeing around the corners is one of them, the latest. And Rita, welcome to our show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you're so sweet. Listen, you are such a, an amazing source of inspiration. And, and I, I need to ask you about one question, which is about the personal inflection points. I certainly tried that when COVID-19 hit, we had to suddenly change this world from our point of view and create our own m, &M show which laid on show to become one of the most successful shows right now on linkedin that forced me out of my comfort zone i certainly learned something about that what's your take on this whole way of having an infliction in your life well i think this is also related to the science of imagination which is our brains get stimulated by something that is unexpected. And very often we frame that in negative terms. So it didn't work out. I didn't get the contract. I lost the job I wanted. But when you really think about it, all that's doing is it's provoking you, right? It's saying your assumptions about the world are not meshing with the world that you're now experiencing. And that can be an enormous point of departure for learning. And this is positive, right? Because some people tend to look at this in a negative light. They basically say, well, listen, this is horrible. Life is after me. You, you look at it differently, right? Everything is positive and that generates that opportunity, right? It can, um, you know, and I'm not saying there aren't horrible things that happen in the world, so I'm not no, saying that, no. especially now. But um, I think very often in our personal lives, we kind of coast along, and it isn't until we have some kind of personal disruption that we have either the courage or the necessity or the will to do something different. And it can often be a, a, a springboard to a much richer future. Mm. You know, Marshall? you know, Rita, one of the things that I learned from our friend Alan Malali relates to what you've said. There's a tendency when something happens called an exogenous shock, you know, there's something in the environment or things don't go well, to change our goals, mm -hmm. change our goals. And Alan says, don't do that. When you do that, you kill creativity. So, you know, he talks about the importance of don't change your goals, but get back with the group and say, all right, now we have a new challenge. Let's just face it as a new challenge. In terms of our personal life, what advice do you have people about the same type of theme about not necessarily giving up and changing your goals, but just looking at it as a new challenge? Yeah, well, I think one of the things that we get wrong as people about goal setting is that we, we think about our goals in terms of, I want to achieve X or win Y or get Q job, right? So I'll ask a, a leader in a major firm, say, so what, what's your goal? What, what do you want? Oh, I want to be a you know senior vice president level two, grade Q4, right? And I'm like, well, why do you want to do that? You know, And they'll say, well, because then I can bring on the talent I want and I can help them achieve their goals and I can create this awesome golden 
and uh, the partnership. And I said, well, okay, that's really what you want. One vehicle to getting there is being a senior vice president, EVP, whatever. But there are many other ways of getting there. And so I think one of the things Alan's really brilliant about is, is causing people to say, wait a minute, the goal is not this particular thing. You know, the goal could be achieved many ways. Rita, tell me more about feeling by design. You coined that term. I love it. What is the sort of approach if you want to try following that sure. formula? So, so failing by design is a little bit misleading because um, we're not planning to fail, right? What we're saying is there's an approach to something which could be prone to error, which is more intelligent than not. So I talk about intelligent failures. And if you think about it, when you're in a world of high uncertainty, and we're all in a world of high uncertainty right now. I don't care who you are. You don't know what next week's going to hold, let, let alone six months from now. So in a world of high uncertainty, the only way you get data about anything is you have to take actions. And you have a hypothesis about what's going to happen by taking an action. And if the action does not lead to the thing that you hypothesize, that's a failure looked at in some ways. But when you think about it, it's like a scientific test, right? You now know that direction's not fruitful, so we'll go a different direction. So failing by design basically says, let's distinguish between you know not so bright failures where you really should have known better then that's that's not good we don't want to encourage that but in a complex uncertain situation trying small things and failing and trying something different is the only way you're going to build up enough understanding to know what you should be doing beautiful okay coming up what is the number one question you should ask yourself as you design your life i think it's fair to say that the answer will surprise you. Now, I just want to go back to our conversation and I want to challenge you two amazing guests with a challenge. And the challenge is a question from Mario Puccini. He's PepsiCo's chief design officer. And by the way, the first person ever to hold that position at PepsiCo where he was so uh, the design-led innovation across all the company's brands. So with no further ado, let's roll the BCG Minute. Hi, I am Mauro Porcini and I am the SVP and Chief Design Officer of PepsiCo. My question for the m, &M panel is this one. In my book, the human side of innovation, the power of people in love with people, I talk about all these characteristics of the innovators, the ideal innovator. One of them, the one closest to my heart, is the power of kindness. Over the years, sharing this idea with so many people, I received so many feedback about uh, the concept of kindness. Everybody loves it, but often people tell me, wow, I would love to be kind in my life, at work, but people confuse kindness with weakness. If I am kind, they think I'm weak and therefore actually need to behave in the opposite way in everything I do at work in my private life. What do you think about kindness? How to use kindness when you design your life? I can't wait to hear your reflections on this. There's just something about those Italians. They can just articulate things where you just want to go to Italy straight away, right? Rita, what's your reflection on this? Well, I think people confuse kindness, uh, as you said, with a lack of resolve or weakness or telling people what they want to hear, which is actually not kind. Um, as Marshall will tell you, our friend Alan Mullally has, you know, his titanium backbone, but he's very kind. I mean, he's very you know, open to hearing people's point of view and introducing different voices in the room. So I don't think you have to be uh, unkind to be firm. Uh, I would also add, it's very unkind to have feedback for people and withhold it from them. Um, you know, developmental feedback is essential and important and the only path to growth. And a lot of times we think we're being kind by not pointing out how people could really grow and improve. 